thank you all for coming this afternoon. So um, I will, I going against uh, Isa's recommendations, I will start from architecture. I will say a few words. Yeah. I don't know why it doesn't work. Oh, it's yes. really slow. So back in 1933, a boat uh, left uh, uh, Marseille in France uh, with uh, many important architects, art historians, historians and artists uh, with destination Athens and uh, in their trip they, they made uh, some stops in Malta, in uh, the Aegean islands, a few Aegean islands and in Cyprus. And before going to Athens to um, compile what was uh, to become the very famous guidelines for town planning that uh, were produced at the uh, Fourth Congress of International, International Congress of uh, Modern Architecture, they, they passed by uh, Cyprus and Hirokitia. And the, the, the then director of the Department of Antiquities, Porfirios Dikeos, showed them the few parts of the, of the, of the Hirokitia site that were uh, visible at the time. Uh, a few years later, he would uh, go ahead and uh, start his excavations to discover, to unearth the rest of the, of the site. Sorry, but this is very slow. And uh, you can see here what we are going to talk about today. This is uh, the Hirokitia settlement, which is a Neolithic settlement uh, which was inhabited between 7th and 6th uh, millennia BC. It was abandoned for, uh, uh, for a thousand years and then uh, re-inhabited again for until 3900 uh, BC. The settlement uh, has been through uh, various phases. The two most important phases <laughs> are what you see here, these two. This is the, um, the first configuration of the of the village and this is the second one and uh, underneath this layer you can see the um, the settlement uh, which is comprised of this kind of structures which are very uh, important this is a I forgot to say this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and uh, you can see that um, this combination of uh, four five six up to six uh, inhabitation units comprise one uh, house, one family house, and this is the entrance to, to the village. So what we are interested in uh, is to compare and uh, test different uh, methodologies, analytical and um, stochastic, uh, to study the relation between the space in between these structures, which was uh, obviously the half of the of the house, it was a more uh, private part of the uh, of, of of the settlement, uh, together with the network of the more public uh, parts of the. Of, of, the, of the settlement. And uh, one can clearly read here uh, the, how these units were basically uh, located around this empty space, uh, which was uh, obviously surrounded by, by them in a way that would allow the inhabitants to control this, this uh, space. For us, uh, there is a, a big interest in, in this because, and this is why I, I started from the architects and the, the town planners, this uh, is considered as a proto-urban uh, environment. And uh, it's, uh, it's important in the larger scale of, uh, um, of studying the development of the architectural typology of the courtyard, which we know it's very important for that part of, the, of that region, the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East uh, region, as uh, the space where uh, more communal activities would take uh, place and even uh, rituals. This is the, uh, the mess, as Isa says, uh, of uh, the, the current uh, conditions and how the, 
the archaeological site is uh, currently at the stage at which it is. Uh, I just want to say that uh, the where is the yeah you have to go with the like I know. just wanted to show that uh, in the beginning <laughs> they thought that uh, the, uh, the the first archaeologist Vikios uh, who who excavated the site they thought that uh, there is a, a line you can see in the middle it's basically a wall and they thought that this was the street network of the village and I'm mentioning this because it links very well with the discussion we had earlier uh, especially uh, in the case of uh, Catherine's uh, talk uh, with regards to the uh, the circulation networks of, of the villages what the archaeologists that took over from Porfirios Vikios, uh, Odile Lebrun and co-author of this, uh, this paper uh, who, was, uh, who has been studying the, the site since the 70s uh, in the context of the French uh, archaeological mission discovered uh, basically was that this was uh, an, um, an enclosure wall for the, the, the site, for the village and uh, hence the two phases they, uh, where we saw el earlier that the the site, uh, the inhabitants of the of the village moved outside of, of this wall and they built uh, another wall. Okay. Yes, now it's working. Thank you very much. So we, for our studies and our models, we will only focus on we will only use this uh, layer of the uh, of the inhabitation units. Uh, and you can see the, here their spatial location and configuration. Uh, I just want to mention that um, these gray areas that you can see here, like cells, are um, um, houses that they, they have been um, identified by the, the archaeologists. The red uh, circles are the, the, the habitation structures that they have been identified uh, on their specific height that they were concurrent they were coexistent at, at that specific uh, period of, of time and the the blue ones were um, based they were created by us on foundations that were excavated but uh, we we can't really nobody can really uh, say uh, of their um, period because the archaeologists have found 12 different layers of uh, architectural uh, structures and because of the law in Cyprus they are not allowed to demolish the upper therefore the more um, contemporary structures in order to, to discover what, is, what lies uh, beneath them mm, maybe you have to click on the yeah. there. Okay. so this is a um, uh, uh, reconstruction and um, a very nice uh, point cloud model of the, of the of the site that has been documented with uh, um, laser scanner and uh, drone photogrammetric techniques oh, sorry about that yeah I'll, I'll get rid of this okay these are the structures that we we are, we are working on uh, with uh, located on the right uh, position and the right uh, height <laughs> okay, okay, we're switching it off. That's it. That's it. Game over. <laughs> uh, let's just get rid of it. Yeah. And now I will hand over to, to Isa. And, and I will have I will... zero technical problems because I just switched off what, uh, what wasn't working. So, in terms of that site, um, we're really interesting in things that we, we cannot know. We're interested in where did people go in that city and why did they go there and why did they build where they built and not somewhere else and which areas of that city were important and which were just, you know, suburbia where, where, where nobody was actually interested in them. And the data available for studying this kind of stuff is none. I mean, you know, in the modern city, you put a camera and you count the number of people that walk through a street. But unfortunately, the ancient uh, Cypriots were absolutely not concerned about our research and they have done zero count of how many people walked where and how this, those spaces were used. So 
what we have left is just kind of the outline of possibilities. You know, nobody walked, let's assume, nobody walked on the ceilings of buildings. But actually, it is very difficult to, to try to imagine what kind of data could, uh, could, uh, could tell us something more about the frequency of pedestrian movement at different areas, at the different streets of, of that city. Um, so, so when we model movement, we can go two paths. We can go for analytical methods, such as uh, least cost paths or space syntax methods, which basically take the whole, the whole picture and, and calculate kind of the baseline. Or we can look at stochastic methods, such as agent-based modeling, which tries to, to reconstruct that movement from the bottom up. So this is a key, uh, a key division. So, so let's look a little bit closer at the differences. When you look at the analytical methods, the top-down methods, they basically try to tell us if all people do X, uh, this is their combined movement pattern. We here um, assume that every person is the same that there is not much of a, you know, we don't model, homo uh, we model homogeneous population. And this is static over time. If you create a space syntax of, of, a, of a city, if you put, you know, the same city, you will get the same space syntax uh, uh, results. Um, and as we're modeling it, we are kind of assuming that all people that, that were in the city and were moving, um, they are, that we assume that they had global knowledge and then they were rational, behaving in a rational manner, and then they were optimizing. So we're kind of running this idea, what, how would the world look if, uh, if it was ideal world? Uh, and this is really, really useful in the sense that you get pretty quick results and they're pretty crisp and there's no much problem with analyzing them. It is, it is actually very easy to interpret what you get. But this is, this, is the, this is a really good baseline. But we know that world is an ideal. And, and people are anything but rational beings most of the time. Um, they have very limited global knowledge and they're usually just satisfied and not optimized. People are also different. So there is a different movement pattern for a family of four, I can tell you that, as compared to say a single person who's a student. And that dynamics may change over time as the population of the city changes. You have cities where most of the population is young and you have cities where most of the population is old. The movement pattern between those two will be different. So in order to model this kind of stuff, you use the bottom-up approaches such as agent-based modeling. And this looks at the question in a bit more messy way. It's asked if people they X, Y and Z, depending on their goals and who they are, then this is, it, this is their combined movement pattern. And as much as this is bringing you closer, closer to reality, it also has a price that needs to be paid. And the price is that this kind of methods are way more computationally expensive. The results are way more messy and difficult to analyze. And there you have a good chance of really shit results that you actually don't know what the heck is, is going on. So as, much as the, so as much as the analytical methods or the top-down methods are really good as a baseline, once you start moving towards the kind of more realistic uh, scenarios, um, you, you, know, you go for the bottom-up approaches. Um, and it's important to remember that it's very difficult to interpret those bottom-up approaches if you don't have a baseline. So what we did is we run both, because why not? So let's start with the top-down analytical methods. And we see here um, the isovistas of uh, each one, from each one of these um, uh, communal um, uh, spaces in between the, the inhabitation uh, uh, units or the courtyards of each house with a clear priority to the entrance of the, uh, of the village. And uh, the second experiment we, we ran was uh, with regards to network uh, uh, connectivity. And we see here uh, graphs of the um, connectivity of these uh, spaces. I don't know if we, we can come back later if there is time or more quest uh, or questions with regards to the, the algorithm we, we use to, to produce these, uh, uh, these graphs. But basically, the, the logic is that we were trying to, to see the depth of the, of the network of, of these uh, spaces, starting from the entrance of the, of, of the village. Uh, and we also have deployed some bottom-up approaches, not some, but one, agent-based modeling. Um, and, you know, 
because it's not an all out call approach, you already have to start making certain decisions. So you have to decide whether you're going to see what would it, how would it look if people walked at random or if they would mostly walk forward and not kind of back on themselves. What if they, they had targeted walk? So, you know, they were more interested in walking from point A to point B. Or what, if, what happens if you have a mix of the above? And where do they start their walk? Do they start at a random point, at the entrance of the village, at, at their house? So you already see that a lot of scenarios can be constructed out of it. So let's just have a look at some preliminary results. Um, this, is, this is the plan of the village and those are the little agents. I made them bigger. So that's that, no. so, sorry for interrupting you, just to say that the uh, interior curve that you see is the, 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 the rock bed of the, of the hill. So basically we know for sure that they, they wouldn't build uh, in this area or and therefore walking. one can can uh, limit the, the movement of the agents between the two curves. Yes. Um, okay. So let's start with random walk. Um, if you just release them from the entrance, you can see the, the lighter the, the pattern, uh, the, more, uh, the more of kind of human movement happen over this area. And random walk is a stupid algorithm because most of the time people just turn on themselves and go backwards, which is not very realistic, but it is a good, it is a good baseline to see. Um, a way better uh, way of this describing human movement is a correlated random walk in which um, you, you have a probability um, of going forward that is higher than probability of just turning around and, and going backwards. And that probability is distributed as a normal distribution as you see there. So if you have an agent and he's pointing forward, then the next step is more likely to be forward or at an angle slightly off forward than turning around and going back. And so you can see that already that those two maps differ and depending on how we model the walk, we're gonna get different results. Here they're also starting from the, more or less from the entrance. And we can also start correlated random walk, so the same as previously, but starting from different points throughout the village. And you can see how you can cumulatively run your experiment and, and kind of use it as a heuristic tool to understand the movement and understand those patterns and, and think about it and think what was important for, for those people and how can we model it. Um, you can also do targeted walk. In this case, uh, it looks quite funny, but basically everyone just kind of has a goal and they start from one point and then you, they go straight there. So you have those straight line. Uh, by comparing those different methods in, and then comparing them to the analytical methods, we can see um, what were the different possibilities. And, and as we gonna, since this is preliminary, um, preliminary research more as a proof of concept than anything else, as we're gonna add more complexity of the movement and, and more, you know, statistical ways of analyzing it, you know, we can co start combining those methods and, and combining those algorithms. And uh, to just conclude very quickly, um, the case study we're presenting here is just a, a way, is just a proof of concept to say that perhaps, you know, we've been doing a uh, GIS based analysis on, on urban spaces for quite a while now. And we actually understand it quite well at this point. So perhaps it's now the time to go a little bit further in the kind of messy world of agent based modeling and actually trying to figure out uh, how individual behavior can lead to, to global patterns. And I would like to, to, to finish. We, we are using now our uh, discussion time, right? Two minutes left. Of okay, discussion. great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that for, for us, it's, uh, this is a great challenge to produce the, uh, like a, a map of various scenarios uh, using the, all these uh, tools and apply them on very messy data. Nobody knows and nobody will uh, really understand ever what has happened in the transformation of the of these uh, uh, village and we have very little uh, real information uh, from from the archaeological uh, studies so for us since it is a such a proto urban uh, space it's a, it's a great opportunity a great opportunity to uh, play and experiment with this uh, these tools to see what we can learn that it would have been otherwise impossible to, as a scenarios, to come up with a uh, hypothesis. We know only the entrances for very few of these uh, structures, 
And as I said, we have 12 different uh, layers, so levels, architectural levels, and we will never be able to really decipher the coexistence of uh, which, uh, with, with, between them, basically, other than the few that we, we used here in this uh, study. Right, thank, thank you very you. much.